People say it's very hard today to make an audience listen and understand Shakespeare. But Shakespeare's theatre is built on bringing those words alive. Speak the speech, I pray you, as I pronounced it to you trippingly on the tongue. But if you mouth it, as many of your players do, I had as leaf the town crier who spoke my lines. The way he writes, if you tap into it, he's guiding, he's directing, he's giving hints to an actor. Sometimes these modern dress ones can be really weird. <laughs> Barry, what are you doing next? The miracle I'm still is that you can give a difficult speech of Shakespeare to some intelligent people and say, read it once and tell me what it says. They can't do it. But if they listen to an actor say it once, who really knows what it's about and act it, they'll understand it. Shakespeare did not write these words to be read. It's like uh, sheet music. Uh, you, don't, you don't just look at it. It's just a bunch of notes on a page. This was meant to be played. I think actually we're going to go downstairs. Did you? Yeah. I hated it. Until you find somebody. Until I found somebody and a part that I could feel passionate about. Right. Amphimachus. Amphimachus. Petroclus. 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 I had heard of John Barton for years. I remember British actors telling me, John Barton is the man who made Shakespeare come alive for me. And so we brought him over to do these workshops. John gives you some structure, some starting point in terms of how to approach Shakespeare. Well, I think off we go. And I think the most difficult thing in any workshop is the awful moment of starting it. Because here I am with a crowd of solemn people looking at me, and I want to break down the atmosphere of reverence around me. The point of having an audience at a workshop is because the workshop is going to be about communicating, sharing, and listening. And one of the questions I will ask at times with a difficult bit of text is, did you follow that? Did you understand a word that they were saying? Did you, did you listen? Or did you get the point or were you bored or something? So your response is important to what we set up, what we explore here. And I believe that it's helpful to an actor coming to Shakespeare if they either have never done it or if they haven't done it much, is to point out to them that there are maybe six, maybe ten, not more, very basic things that Shakespeare does in the way he writes, which is are ever-present, they're always, always turning up. You can find them in any speech. And that if the actor tunes in and can use them and tap into them, they very soon find their way with Shakespeare. If they don't, and they're not aware of the writing devices that Shakespeare uses, they get themselves into a muddle. Does that make sense as a starting point? I've made far too long a speech, therefore I will start <laughs> and do a speech. What I want us to look at is the experience, not just of relishing a wonderful bit of writing, but it is one of the places in Shakespeare where he does address the audience and gives them instructions and advice. And he keeps saying, imagine things, work your thoughts, see a siege. It's a different kind of theatre. Oh, for a muse of fire that would ascend the brightest heaven of invention. A kingdom for a stage, princes to act, and monarchs to behold the swelling scene. Then should the warlike Harry, like himself, assume the port of Mars, and at his heels, leashed in like hounds, should famine, sword, and fire crouch for employment. If somebody says, oh, for a muse of fire, it's a pretty rousing start <laughs> to passion what he wants. But he then says, but he can't do it. And it's written on a contradiction between, I would like to do this in a big movie with a thousand tanks and extras, but we're in a tiny little tatty theater. 
So we can't do it unless we imagine it. That co contradiction is done brilliantly verbally. Our idea that the whole thing is about relationships is not the primary one with Shakespeare. You work on the audience through the language centrally. The text keeps changing between high language and naturalistic and down-to-earth language. It's a very, in a general wash sense, poetic speech, but a lot of it isn't. And this cockpit hold the vasty fields of France? Or may we cram within this wooden O the very casks that did affright the air at Agincourt? Oh, pardon. Since a crooked figure may in little place attest a million, and let us ciphers to this great account on your imaginary forces work. And then he gets to the most important line to me, almost, on your imaginary forces work. That, that to me, is, he's demanding of the audience to use their imagination and to work. If the text is alive and working, it'll reverberate onto us. Peace out our imperfections with your thoughts. Into a thousand parts divide one man and make imaginary puissance. Think when we talk of horses that you see them printing their proud hoofs in the receiving earth. For tis your thoughts that now must deck our kings. Carry them here and there, jumping o'er times, turning the accomplishment of many years into an hourglass. For the which supply, admit me, chorus to this history, who, prologue-like, your humble patience pray, gently to hear, kindly to judge. Our play! When I was uh, introduced to Shakespeare in high school, I didn't really understand it, and, and it was frustrating, and then I was afraid of it, and then I hated it. It was as an actor that I found my way into Shakespeare. No, that, that's great, because that... What's great about John is that no sooner do you think you're uh, appreciating language and giving it its due in Shakespeare, then he'll stop and say, well, well you know, you're, you're loving it to death. You know, you're making a meal of it. It's too much. It, that's pretty straightforward. Just say it. I think I'd quite like to do Diomed and Cressida. The situation here is poor old Cressida has been away from Troy in a hostage exchange and she's among the Greeks and is in the process of being seduced by the Greek Diomed. He is a sexual tough realist who's pressing to go to bed with her. She's attracted to him but she doesn't want to betray Troilus who she's in love with. That's the situation. It's incredibly simple in the writing. These very short lines. Give it me again. Whose was it? <laughs> Tell. And they're firing at full guns on the words. It's like a rally at tennis. Their aces are being served or counterattacks are being made, whizzing across the net. But it's the text that is the bedrock of making it work. Mm -hmm. have, a, have a bash. How now, my charge? Any piece of theater has to be lived one line at a time. And that's the moment you're in. That's the moment the audience sees. For that moment, that is the play. So in a funny way, this is a reminder of that. You actually don't have the whole play there on stage at any one time. Now let your mind be coupled with your words. Sweet honey Greek. Tempt me no more to I'm, I'm learning things because it <laughs> happened, it happened. I hadn't spotted it before. How now my charge is, you are his, her guardian, but you're absolutely right, Peter, that charge is also a sexual term for Elizabethan. So the, the word will do both. I hadn't yet, never spotted it. <laughs> Hello, my charge. <laughs> it's, it tells a lot. The single word will do it. It puts the emphasis on making each line a breathing entity. 
any line that doesn't have its own life is dead. <laughs> How now, my charge? <laughs> now, my sweet guardian. Now, oh. then, anyway, I'm going to pick me, I'm going to take you through the words. And you answer with my sweet guardian. What is your sexual implication there? I do not know. But the word, you're coming back with a G word against a G word. That's not accidental in the writing. <laughs> We're going to look at this yeah. text as if it's the most dense bit of poetry in Shakespeare. How oh, now, my charge? Now, my sweet guardian, hark a word with you. That was a bit passive. You've got to... You actually want to have a word with him. <laughs> <laughs> I've got something to say to you. Throw the words at him. Now, my sweet guardian, hark a word with you. I think John's great trick, in some way, is distracting the actor from being an actor so that he can be a human being. And that was Shakespeare's great trick as a writer. What would you have me do? What did you swear you would bestow on me? I pray thee, do not hold me to mine oath. Bid me do anything but that. Right, let me stop you there. Good. The, I, I should say, what I want to take us to now, and one of the reasons I've picked this bit of text, there is something very peculiar about it, which is terribly obvious, one points it out, but easy to overlook, that it's perhaps a supreme example of a scene in Shakespeare which is almost all written in monosyllables. I shall have it. What, this? I that. If it's all monosyllabic, it's very abrasive. Mm. It's very charged. I'll have this. Whose was it? It is no matter. Come tell me whose it was. It was one that loved me better than you will. This is a, a classic trap scene because it looks like a kind of naturalistically playable scene that's going to get into a muddle if you try and play it that way. And Diamond is so deliberate, like setting a rhythm, it's like he's, he's trying to control her with his rhythm and she's trying to resist it in different ways. So what matters is whether the audience want to listen and know what's going to happen next and hang on to every word. That's the precious gift. You can act terribly well. You can act with great emotional power and panache. But it doesn't necessarily mean the audience will listen. It's very important in a workshop that one is not trying to bring a scene to performance or to perfection. One's taking the bit of text to find out what will help the actor that he can then use as he builds a performance. I've directed a lot of Shakespeare and I've probably done all the ones I know how to do or want to do. Long, long ago, Peter Hall asked me to join him when he founded the Royal Shakespeare Company and he wanted me to help with the actors working on the text and language and verse. Well, of course, you could stress it that way if you went for the play and said, and I play, too, if you picked out that theatre metaphor. Oh, you? playboy, play. Yeah. Thy mother plays, and I play, too. That's possible, isn't yeah. it? it is I had never met that. such intensity in a director before. I'd never been in the presence of a man who could exclude the world, forget time, forget where he is, indeed, as he's well known, I mean, literally forget where he is because he's famous for falling over things and falling off stages and so forth, because the, the world around him it seems to be irrelevant. The only thing that matters is his attention on the actors and the language that they're speaking. It's just that he's an absent-minded professor. He doesn't quite realize, because his mind is on higher things, what he's doing. You know, finding his way through a sonnet for him is like sailing up the Thames on a sunny day. It's a nice thing to do. I think people in history are not a mystery to John. Why do you stay so long, my lords of France? I was shy of him. I was nervous of this Big great boss. guy, and I was new in the company. But as soon as I started, he stopped me, and he began to break down the speech 
in a way that no one had ever done it for me before. I was just used to thinking in terms of emotion and certainly to an extent in terms of character and a little in terms of imagery. I thought that was a wonderful use of verse. So much so that at the end of the hour, when I, I uh, exhausted from the, the kind of intellectual battering that I thought I'd taken on this, I looked at my script and I found that almost every other word in my script was now either underlined or circled. And I wondered how I could possibly translate all of this, this intense masterclass in verse speaking that I've been given into a living performance. But I struggled with it, and a few days later, I had this 45-minute session with him. And even more intense than the first, except I got to go through the speech more times. When that session was over and I looked at my script, I found that every line that hadn't been underlined or circled now was. So in a sense, what he had said to me was, there is not a word that is insignificant in this speech. Everything has a significance, a meaning, and a place, and it's all linked to all of the other significant moments. In the late 50s, early 60s, John Barton joined forces with Peter Hall and created the Royal Shakespeare Company. They knocked the dust off the old style of acting Shakespeare and led the way to a new stripped down, fresh style. And started a movement in a way, in terms of how Shakespeare should be played. See, I think most people, if you say to them, Shakespeare in acting, think of a very overweight lady or gentleman moaning and groaning and shouting and gesticulating. They certainly don't think of it as something witty, lean, quick, spoken trippingly on the tongue, funny, abrasive, strange, you know. I will buy with you, sell with you, talk with you, walk with you, and so following. But I will not eat with you, drink with you, nor pray with you. Ho, <laughs> ho, what news on the Rialto? John and Peter he? passionately feel American actors have intuitively uh, a feeling for Shakespeare's language and structure, and certainly for character, and certainly for emotion. Cursed be my tribe if I forgive him. Shylock, do you hear? I am debating of my present really story. It really depends on having that yeah. little beat after tribe. Cursed be my tribe, end of line, if I forgive him. Shylock, do you hear? I know the iambic when I drill it over yeah, the weekend. But then... I get in here, it goes right off my but you've skull. Got, I mean, that's inevitable. It's exactly like an actor learning a dance or a singer learning a song. You learn the dance, you learn the steps, you learn the notes. There then comes a point when you have to, as we say, make it your own. And the point when you make it your own is when you understand what you have to feel in order to make that end result the actual expression. I am not bid for love. They flatter me. But yet I'll go in hate to feed upon. But yet I'll go... That was right. Yeah, I know, I'm just trying to hear. Where a pleasure for sure. But why am I going? Why do I want to go? They don't want me because they love me. But even though I know they don't love me, I'll go and I'll bring my own hate. They flatter, okay, they flatter me. But yet I'll go in hate to feed upon the prodigal Christian. Great, great. In the end, it's how to help a modern actor act and be, act freely handling Shakespeare's text. Attack us more. OK. I have to get a sense of that actor and how they tick and what is helpful to them. Under whose shade the ramping lion slept whose top branch overpeered Jove's spreading tree. And I just feel so acty, because I'm... <laughs> <laughs> well, it, I'm it's this. not necessarily a crime. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, the point is, it's the juices of this marvellous bit of rhetoric. Isn't it? And we, I, of course, you, you, we can go over the top here. Yeah? You won't be punished. <laughs> no. <laughs> we will now go over the top. <laughs> 
You're left alone. Somebody has just, just thrown down a ring in front of you and you pick it up and that's the situation. Where the hell did this come from? Shall I just start? Just do and then I'll react. OK. Anything will okay. do. <laughs> All offers gratefully received. OK. I left no ring with her. What means this lady? Fortune forbid my outside have not charmed her. She made good view of me. Indeed, so much that sure methought her eye had lost her tongue. For she did speak in starts. Distractedly, she loves me, sure. Very good. Now, look, my rule is I'm not allowed to direct you. I'm only allowed to, to give you... <laughs> hints to put you in all bits, all okay. things about the text. This one I'm using, not just because it's a wonderful text, but because it's a real tester about playing the storyline. You actually did it more describing all the things that are happening. Mm -hmm. but you actually don't know what's happening. The comedy is to do with they know, they watch you, who are normally witty, quick, intelligent and sensitive, actually a bit thick at first. Right. And I think that the secret might be on the gear change is not to go straight into She Loves Me Sure. I mean, you don't realise till the moment. And the verse line goes, for she did speak and starts distractedly. <laughs> However you time it, right. you'll do it. If you just live okay. that story. OK. I left no ring with her. What means this lady? Fortune forbid my outside have not charmed her. She made good view of me. Indeed, so much that sure methought her eye had lost her tongue. For she did speak in starts, distractedly. She loves me, sure. That, but, that's lovely. But yeah. that, did that feel right? Did yeah. You, let me come in here and say, what are the big gear changes? Because the problem is... One always tends to generalise or make it even in rhythm. I want the, any actor to sense themselves where Shakespeare is steadying the scene, speeding up or whatever, because if a long speech becomes a statement or generalised, I stop listening. If I sort of get the point, I tend to... Well, I'm quite enjoying this, but I don't actually listen to every word. And that's what Shakespeare wants us to do. Going to now do the well-known bit of Hamlet's advice to the players. What's more interesting for an audience here is not that Hamlet's saying it, but that at this point in the play, one of the characters make us think about the nature of theatre. That's, that's very Shakespearean. Speak the speech, I pray you, as I pronounced it to you, trippingly on the tongue. But if you mouth it, as many of our players do, I had as lief the town crier spoke my lines. An actor trap is to play the mood or the emotion or the general results of a speech rather than that speech coming out of something lived, discovered and worded in the moment. Suit the action to the word, the word to the action. With this special observance that you o'erstep not the modesty of nature. For anything so overdone is from the purpose of playing, whose end, both at the first and now, was and is to hold as toward the mirror up to nature, show virtue her feature, scorn her own image, the very age and body of the time, his form and pressure. His form and pressure. Any ideas? That statement of Shakespeare's says something to the audience about why you're doing it, we're doing, working on Shakespeare at all, and why do we do it today? Our lives and the life of the theatre is about the pressure of the moment. And therefore, a good play, well acted, makes that bridge between the modern and the contemporary and the Elizabethan. We are, for good or ill today, in a culture that is primarily visual, rather than verbal. But if you've got a great and timeless writer, 
What the actors and director have to do is to take a modern audience into another world. Time melts. That's what I'm after. The average audience in a theatre don't really listen to complex language unless the actor shares it, makes them listen, argues it well and communicates it. We seem to have lost that love of language. And while it's a pleasure to do Shakespeare, it's also, um, there's a challenge that's being posed for a contemporary actor. There are certain tools, certain techniques that have to be sharpened. And so if, if Shakespeare's gonna stay alive in the 21st century, I, I think it's up to the actors. Words, vows, gifts, Tears and love's full sacrifice he offers in another's enterprise. Now, I think what we do here is maybe audience, let, if you haven't done so, let's all have a look at the text. This bit of text, one of the reasons I picked to start with, it, it, it enables me to say what I think is the single most important thing about the way Shakespeare writes. He writes in antithesis. Do you know what we mean by antithesis? You look into this speech, virtually there's something antithetical the whole time, and it's that that gives us the character and the situation. It's about something, it's about contradictions. I love him, but I'm going to hide it. Because I'm like this and I'm like that. If you share with us the contradictions in yourself, the character starts to build and we get interested in you. Look at how he sets a word or an idea against another word. And unfolds human life as something full of ambiguities and contradictions. That's a way of writing which then expresses itself through characters, and all characters in Shakespeare at some point use that device. Now, let's do it again, and let's just follow it in the text. You do it to them, and we'll just point out to them as they come. Words, vows, gifts, tears, and love's full sacrifice, he offers in another's enterprise. Well, I thought that was one antithesis you didn't get. What happens is there's a list at the beginning. But the words that matter are he offers in another's enterprise, isn't ah, it? Uh -huh. it? It doesn't quite make sense to me if that antithetical thought is needed. Yeah, uh -huh. Do it again. Words, vows, gifts, tears, and love's full sacrifice, he offers in another's enterprise. But more in Troilus thousandfold I see than in the glass of Pander's praise may be. And it's the same sort of thing, isn't it? I see as opposed to Panda. Ah. It's a similar thing. But more in Troilus thousandfold I see than in the glass of Pander's praise may be. I think the other thing I would say, it is written in rhyme, that is a fact. So the first acting problem is, what do you do about rhyme? <clears throat> well, I would suggest something quite simple, is that if you ignore it, it sounds phony, therefore you have to use it. Part of your character, your wit, your imagination is that you know you're talking in rhyme. Mm. I am so with it, I'm so sexy and <laughs> attractive that I can do it all in rhyme when I want to. <laughs> right, therefore, first thing to you is play the rhymes as your words, because the process is to make these words your own. I've always believed in coming to do workshops here, it's important to have one English actor, which is why I've asked Harriet to come. People say, oh dear, but you all know something in England about Shakespeare that we don't hear, etc. Crap. <laughs> <laughs> this scene is an absolute classic of why of Shakespeare's shifting between verse and prose and really just sharing together why does he do it? What happens? Here, the prose is obviously to do with making jokes and being light and easy. And, and verses to do with something emotionally deeper. It isn't always that, it could be the opposite. But I, it's just, this is a very good 
simple example where one can show fairly clearly why it's going from one to the other. Dost thou in conscience think, tell me, Amelia, that there be women do abuse their husbands in such gross kind? There be some such, no question. Wouldst thou do such a deed for all the world? Why, would not you? No, by this heavenly light. Nor I neither by this heavenly light. I might do it as well in the dark. <laughs> Shrew me if I would do such a wrong for the whole world. Why, the wrong is but a wrong in the world, and having the world for your labour, tis a wrong in your own world, and you might quickly make it right. I do not think there is any such woman. Yes, a dozen. And as many to the advantage as would store the world they played for. Then, it, then is the big change where Amelia goes into verse of signing off prose and suddenly a need for you to use verse because you're not being flipped. So what is verse? All it means is the rhythm that goes de dum de dum de dum de dum de dum. That is blank verse. So on we go. But I do think that it is husbands' faults if their wives do fall. Say that they slack their duties and pour our treasures into foreign laps, or else break out in peevish jealousies, throwing restraint upon us, or say they strike us, or scant our former having in despite. Well, we have galls, and though we have some grace, yet have we some revenge. It's terribly like great jazz playing. Now, the essence of jazz is it is individualistic. It's a celebration of the individual. There isn't another Charlie Parker. There's Charlie Parker, that's it. But what there is, is a tune and a rhythm uh, and somebody, an extraordinary jazz musician, taking liberties with that rhythm and nearly breaking, nearly breaking the rhythm, nearly, nearly falling off the whole machine. Is frailty that thus errs? It is so too. And have not we affections, desires for sport and frailty as men have? Then let them use us well. Else let them know the ills we do, their ills instruct us so. It nearly misses the beat, but never does. And great Shakespearean acting never misses the, the beat of the verse, but is flexible against it in counterpoint. We're taught in our culture to say, what is my motivation? I think that's the wrong question. I think it's more useful to start a scene or a part by saying, what am I reacting to? What pressure is on me that makes it necessary for me to do something or makes me want to do something? Kevin's played Hamlet. It's a well-known text. And I just want to use it as a talking point about character in terms of how does Shakespeare build a character. But the whole point with the character of Hamlet and indeed the soliloquies is they're incredibly inconsistent. If you try to say Hamlet is this or is that, the text resists it and the, a, a bad Hamlet takes his cue from one of the soliloquies and works everything out in relation to it. In the way I think Shakespeare builds characters, they're almost all built on contradictions, ambiguities and reversals. He actually says, the most important lines to me in the part, I, it's not interpretation, it's a fact. He says, I do not know why yet the things to do since I have cause and means and will to do it. I don't know, I don't understand my own character. That's wonderful. I think acting help to anybody playing Hamlet. To be or not to be. That is the question. Whether Sorry, it is I must say one other thing. I must say, because it's louder. It's what? also, as you're, it's a, it's, it's, it makes it easier, obviously, if you're raising the question for your friends, the audience. Acting tip. There are questions in the speech. When there's a question, always play the question. Should we do it once more? Yeah, sure. 
be or not to be? That is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against a sea of troubles, and by opposing, end them, to die, to sleep, no more, and by sleep, Say, we end the heartache and the thousand natural shocks that flesh is heir to. Tis a consummation devoutly to be wished. To die. To sleep. Sleep. A chance to dream. Aye, there's the rub. For in that sleep of death, what dreams may come when we have shuffled off this mortal coil must give us pause. There's the respect that makes calamity of so long life. For who would bear the whips and scorns of time? The oppressor's wrong, the proud man's contumely, the pangs of disprized love, the law's delay, the insolence of office, and the spurns that patient merit of the unworthy takes when he himself might his quietus make with a bare bodkin. Who would fardels bear to grunt and sweat under a weary life but that the dread of something after death, the undiscovered country from whose born no traveler returns, puzzles the will and makes us rather bear those ills we have than fly to others that we know not of. Thus conscience does make cowards of us all. Thus, the native view of resolution is sickly door with the pale cast of thought. And enterprises of great pitch and moment, with this regard, their currents turn awry and lose the name of action. Doesn't it? <laughs> mm. well, we, well, that was not that was very remarkable. Did I say that all right? I felt that it, he kept flip-flopping. You know, yeah, it's like, yeah. I, wanna, I wanna do something, but I keep thinking. And when I think about it, I can't do what I'm supposed to do. The whole irony, and is it funny, is it tragic? It's that you have this profound exploration and you get nowhere. And to be human means the, all these contradictions. What Shakespeare does is describe the experience of being a human being. If you're the king who's been thrown out, if you're the king who's coming in, if you're the wife of the king who's been thrown out, if you're the page who's done nothing but work for that king all your life and now you're out of a job, each of them describes the experience of life in a different way. And that is done with language. There's no substitute for it. The problem in Shakespeare always is how can you speak the lines when you're supposed to be very emotional? Because he wants the actor to contain the emotion that he's feeling inside by the use of this text. By, by, it's like me saying, I, I must not cry because I wish to tell you exactly, but the tears are there, the emotion is there. Now, might I do it pat? Now he is a praying, and now I'll do it. And so he goes to heaven, and so am I revenged. That would be scanned. A villain kills my father, and for that I, his sole son, do this same villain send to heaven. Why, well, this is higher in salary, not revenge. If somebody does an extraordinary breakdown, 
They've done it. You don't need the text. What, what, what Shakespeare does is about handling emotion. It's not about it, primarily about expressing it. It's about the, the, the character needs themselves to talk about it, to handle it. If you actually surrender to it, the odds are there's a moment where an audience shares and feels it, but then they don't listen. In the scene between Beatrice and Benedict, it is very much a dialogue of passing the ball one to another because over and over, one of them picks up on the other one's word, don't they? The gun's been fired at the end of the line and that passes something on to him that he has to throw back to you. It's always a musical thing. The point I'm trying to make is that the clues to the character are more built into the writing than we often notice. They're two very clever people expressing themselves. That in itself is the juice and excitement of the scene, and that, in a sense, is a relationship. Lady Beatrice, have you wept all the while? Yea, and I will weep a while longer. I will not desire that. You have no reason. I do it freely. Surely I do believe your fair cousin was wrong. Ah, how much might the man deserve of me that would write her? Is there any way to show such friendship? Yes, I'm going to stop you there, because just to give you one yeah. example. R right, right or wrong her, each feeds the other. Yeah. And, that, and it wasn't A set up and the other didn't play it back. That's, that's the thing I'm looking at. Yep. If I was only allowed one comment, and I had to shut up, I would say look for the antithesis. Because that's how he writes, how he thinks, how he forms sentences. And sometimes they're very straightforward and witty. Sometimes they're about a contradiction and a paradox. You've got to set the word against the word to share it together. Surely, I, I do believe your fair cousin was wrong. Ah, how much might the man deserve of me who would write her? Is there any way to show such friendship? A very easy way, but no such friend. May a man do it? It is a man's office, but not yours. I do love nothing in the world so much as thee. Is not that strange? As strange as the thing I know not. It were as possible for me to say I love nothing so well as you, but believe me not, yet I lie not. I confess nothing nor deny nothing. I am sorry for my cousin. By my sword, Beatrice, thou lovest me. Well, do not swear by it and eat it. I will swear it by it that you love me, and I'll make him eat it who says I love not you. Will you not eat your word? With no sauce that can be devised to it, I protest I love thee. Well then, God forgive me. For what offense, sweet Beatrice? You have saved me, you have stayed me in a happy hour. I was about to protest that I loved you. And do it with all thy heart? I love you with so much of my heart that I have none left to protest. Come, bid me do anything for thee. Kill Claudio. Oh! Not for the wide world. You kill me to deny it. Farewell. Terry, sweet Beatrice. I am gone, though I am here. There is no love in you. Nay, I pray you, let me go. Be Be Beatrice. Oh, that I were a man for his sake, or that I had any friend would be a man for mine. I cannot be a man with wishing. Therefore, I will die a woman with grieving. Terry, good Beatrice, by this hand, I love you. Use it for my love some other way than swearing by it. Think you in your soul that Count Claudio hath wronged Hero? Yea, as I have a thought or a soul. Enough. I am engaged. I will challenge him. I will kiss your hand. And so leave. By this hand, Claudio shall render me a dear account. As you hear of me, so think of me. Go comfort your cousin. I must say she's dead. So farewell. I think that you, you, you're both doing so well, I'm tempted to get a perfect take, and that would be cheating for a <laughs> workshop. See, I think that there's so many possibilities with Shakespeare that we, we all tend to 
complicated, or in Ben Kingsley's wonderful words, don't clutter, he says. He says he always is apt to clutter. So I'm trying to reduce it to the simple common sense things that will then enable the choices. That's really all I'm sort of trying to do. I think we should just, if we can find it, just listen to a speech where the character talks to their soul, a candle, a sleeping woman, God, etc. Othello is not in a very good state when he comes in, and his soliloquy is all over the place. He talks, well, we should listen because it's quite a guidance to saying there are no rules. You can't say, it, what doesn't work is if you do the whole of a soliloquy to yourself. That's just a, everybody goes to sleep. They think, oh, he's, to be or not to be, there's the question he is thinking about the meaning of life, got the point. Oh, well, it's a famous speech. I can have a rest here. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, just come and, come and have a go, feel your way with it, and we'll explore. Anywhere? Anywhere you like. Yes, you don't have to go up on, on the well, synagogue stage, stage, or you can if you want to. Up you go. <laughs> yeah. It is the cause. It is the cause, my soul. Let me not name it to you, you chaste stars. It is the cause. Yet I'll not shed her blood, nor scar that whiter skin of hers than snow, and smooth as monumental alabaster, yet she must die. I guess part of doing Shakespeare is being, number one, fearless. You have to be fearless to do it. You have to have a kind of um, um, bravado that says, you know, um, I'll embarrass myself up here right now, so what? And if you're in great company and great camaraderie, you're actually encouraged to embarrass yourself, and it's cool. Maybe just imagine that the basic thing in Shakespeare mm -hmm. is that when you're alone on the stage, you know they're there and yeah. they are potential friends or something. Yeah. When you stop what you're doing, the way you've been taught, the way you've been doing it, the habits you've fallen into, and then along comes someone and says, you know, try it this way. It's always it gives you a spark. On a long, deep emotional speech like this, mm -hmm. you've got to keep an audience contact. Mm -hmm. When you shared yourself, one went totally with you. And if you went away from us for too long, I sort of started to observe. Because that is, that is the nature of a soliloquy. I'm not, it's not an interpretive point. It's something that one feels in an audience and indeed feels in you. It's the most simplest and uncomplicated of things. Include the damn audience, you know what I mean? Include your friends. The, the next problem with a very weighty, long soliloquy, is changing gear, find your gear changes. The rhythm of it matters as well as the feelings and the text. It seems at the end of the play that he's in some sort of catatonic state in which some people, critics, stupid critics, say he is. I think the interesting thing about it is that his mind's all over the place. He wants to, he doesn't want to. He, 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 and the, the different things that he's actually doing, is he justifying himself, is he exploring it, is he expressing feelings? The, the, the choices are so many. But sometimes um, the gear changes, at least for me, to move from one to the other. He loves her one second and he hates her the next. Yeah. He's gonna kill her and he's not gonna kill her. And not that nice little time, well, I'll think about it then. Uh, let me indulge a little and then... Uh... But if you can embrace that contradiction because he's he's absolutely determined and yet he can't that he's he's living through a contradiction but i do think the point that the elizabethan actors probably thought quicker than we do is always helpful i think that we find that we churn through a gear change and clearly 
as, it, as in the writing of Shakespeare, it is so full of changes, they must have embraced it in a way that we find harder. We, we study it, we work on it, books are read about it, but the, the text says this yes. change, this change, that's change, and, and the answer is don't rush it, but somehow it's not just that you feel deeply, but that your, your mind works quicker in Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. We Americans sort of think visceral first. We, you know, we think physical, we think emotional first, you know? And um, we feel if we get that, then we can go back to the words. Yeah. Okay. So mm -hmm. knock it about as much as you like. Okay. But John is right. If you really look at the words and you really see, oh, well, he's thinking this way now, and then, oh, now he's back here, now he's over here. You can't help but become physical, physically different. It is a cause, it is the cause, my soul. Let me not name it to you, you chase stars. It is the cause. Yet I'll not shed her blood, nor scar that whiter skin of hers than snow and smooth as monumental alabaster. Yet she must die. Else she'll betray more men. Put out the light, and then put out the light. If I quench thee, thou flaming minister, I can again thy former light restore, should I repent me. But once put out thy light, thou cunning pattern of excelling nature. I know not where is that Promethean heat that can thy light relume. When I have plucked the rose, I cannot give it vital growth again. It needs must wither. I'll smell it on a tree. Oh, balmy breath. And dost almost persuade justice to break her sword. One more. One more. Be thus when thou art dead. And I will kill thee and love thee after. One more, and that's the last. So sweet was ne'er so fatal. I must weep, but they are cruel tears. This sorrow's heavenly, it strikes where it doth love. She wakes. Well, something terrific happened there, I thought. What he absolutely caught then was the thing we were talking about earlier, about the play doesn't stop for a soliloquy. The trap about being alone talking with the audience is if the play stops for someone to talk about it however deep their feelings. That was true when we talked about Hamlet. If one actually sees someone wrestling with it, it becomes dynamic, active, much more painful than if one gets locked into one's own feelings. Mm -hmm. I, I thought that was terrific, really. And I'm really terribly grateful to you. Very good. Thank you Thank very, you. very, Thank very you. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. To do it right and to really live Shakespeare, you have to leave an ounce of your internal essence on the stage floor every night. You know, if you, if you haven't done that, then you haven't done the play or you haven't done the part. And doing Shakespeare can age you. You know, it can drive you to drink and whatever else. But that's, the, the, oh, that's also the love of it. Shakespeare's characters are whole people. There is not a hero that he wrote that has not 
flawed. There's not a villain who is not gifted in some way and has not the potential for great virtue. The reason we can relate to Shakespeare's characters is we recognize ourselves. They're us. And the great thing is that in the text, one can only go so far in one's thoughts and imagination. It's always different if a living actor stands up and does it. It, it, it all begins again. It's almost sort of biblical. The creation has to begin again. Thank you.